All right. So a vector space All right, this idea of a vector space is we have our objects. Um, we have that the operator addition is defined, the operator scalar multiplication is defined, um, and these satisfy our axioms. We have our closure, two closures, and eight at four axioms for the plus, four axioms for the scalar multiplication. And given all that sort of stuff, we had vector spaces, and from vector spaces, we talked about subspaces, we talked about dimensions, uh, we talked about kernels and ranges for operators. on vector spaces, right? So we had vector spaces themselves. We found out, okay, subspaces, dimensions of these particular things, uh, which obviously with dimension comes bases and all these other different ways of working about it. And so in the end, uh, if we're sticking with this concept of like our room, like we talk about R to the N, right? It's, this, it's a space. But on the other hand, we had other types of spaces. But the idea of a space is to be able to locate places, get places, and move things around within our space. And that's what we're supposedly, after this last chapter, that's what we can do, right? We have our space. Where are you? How do you get there? I have stuff in this space. Let's move it to that space. And it does it in a very special way. We'll call it a linear operator. We can represent these linear operators with matrices. But really, it's just the study of, literally, space. Two-dimensional space, one-dimensional space, three, four, five, polynomial space, continuous functional space. It's just stuff, right? These objects, and we're moving around and moving things around. Now, um, that's, that's interesting and all. I can find things, but there might be features of, hey, given this space, this place that I'm at and I'm moving around my space, I feel like sci-fi, imagine a spaceship going through space, right? You're moving around and you're mapping things around. One of the things that we can kind of consider is, you know what? I have space and I look locally, just at this little close spot. Are there some features about this space that seem to be interesting to me? And so if I would look locally and if I would want to study the space itself, and we would like to basically study these internal structures of the space itself. How could we go about doing that? And you know, kind of like the idea of internal structures would be just given two vectors. Kind of like the simplest thing that we can have. If I have two vectors, one of the things that I could ask about this structure and the space, you know, whatever it is, if it's, you know, I'm drawing something that's an RN, so I have vector, um, let's use X's, vector X and vector Y. There could be a couple of things that are of interest to me, all right? And two things that we're going to study at first would be, um, the first one would be a question of, how do I understand length? How do I understand magnitude? This idea, if I have a vector and I'm looking at it, so you're sitting here in space and we have these things going along, and it's like, hey, how far is that? How long is that? That becomes important. It actually becomes very interesting when we start to apply such things to reality, like what's real, real, right? What are we doing? Mathematics, a lot of times, sometimes people will get this kind of flipped, and we do it at the PhD level down to kindergarten type of thing. The difference between real and what's in your head, right? You're modeling. It's the same thing as if you look at, from the way I, I usually try to describe this, is the, the difference between a really high, nice painting versus what's actually there, or a really good photograph versus what's actually there. 
Okay? You can sit there and say one is essentially an approximation that exists within our mind. The nice thing about mathematics is essentially we're painting with these logical models that allows things like, hey, in a certain amount of time, it goes from here to here, and you wait and say, oh, look, it actually, quote, actually did that. But if you really, really measured and really paid attention, you would realize, not really. It was, it was wrong a little bit. And sometimes we'll do things and say, hey, what must have happened? So if I had examples like, you know, I did in the last class, it's like, you come in, I'm dead in the front of the room, you take my body temperature, you wait, you take my body temperature, and I ask, when did Mark die? And so, but the, the problem was, you weren't around. You would sit there and say, well, this is his body temperature now, it's cooling exponentially, I got the second one, which allows me to figure out the curvature of this exponentially decreasing function. Let's go backwards in time and ask, when was his normal body temperature at that point? But all of a sudden it's like, well, no, no, wait a second, you're assuming something. You, you can't go backwards in time, there is no such thing. You're assuming that nothing has possibly changed that something didn't come in here and the temperature of the room completely changed. The fact that something caused some other effect of what you're doing. An, an easy example is, hey, I threw a, there's a ball and you watched it in motion and it went up and went down and hit the ground. Well, when, but if you would put that equation in, you would actually find that there's two times, a negative time and a positive time when it was on the ground. It's like, well, it was never on the ground because I had it in my hand and threw it. This part doesn't even make sense. But the model says it existed. Don't confuse the two, right? And so when we're doing things like this, one of the things that we can do, and this is where kind of some interesting features when you get into physics, length becomes odd. You notice, that, well, how long is it? Well, how in the world do you figure out how long something is? Well, I'm going to measure it. Well, how did you measure it? It's pretty interesting when something's moving, how would you measure how long it is? It's one thing to make it stop and have it in your frame of reference, this table. Could you measure the length of this table if you put it on a car and drove by? Now put it on a spaceship and drive by. Well, yeah, I could use light and make it go back and forth. And you would notice something's happening. As it's moving and you measure it as it's running by, it's getting shorter to you. But is it physically getting shorter? But it's getting shorter to me. And this, that means we get to physics, we call it what? It's relativity, right? We have general and special relativity. It's like, hey, and you'll notice that the other thing is, is that as things go by, other things that you measure, length, like time. Hey, look, it's going by. And you measure it, it's like, figure out, and it's like, wait a second, that guy's watch as he's going by me is ticking slower than it actually should be ticking. Why is time... <laughs> It's like, so you have all of a sudden things that you think you understand, length, becomes weird. But on the other hand, all we're going to do is assume a nice, still, ordinary space. How, how could you figure out length? And we're going to need some sort of math that will spit out. Obviously, that has length. It is what it is. But I want a way to spit out numbers that represent its length. Because if I don't have numbers, it's pretty hard not to be able to do this modeling, right? I need to have math to apply to it. I need to overlay it. I need to paint it with math. So I need numbers to do it. So its length, uh, its length ob obviously exists. What, how do I do it? Now think about the difference between going from Rn. The word length <laughs> needs to probably be replaced with magnitude when we talk about, hey, what about continuous, well, Length, when I use in calculus, how long that line is, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about how long that line is. It's going to have a magnitude concept, which is what? Some sort of contributional thing to the universe of continuous functions. All right, I don't know. Um, polynomial space. How long is a matrix? That doesn't make sense. How, how am I going to work that out? Well, maybe we ought to use the word magnitude to get, get away from a physical tape measure type of question. And the second thing we're going to ask about is, the same, is this idea of same direction, some sort of sameness of direction. Um, and the same direction concept it would have this idea of, really, it's kind of an idea of contribution. If I would have just this here, 
I mean, I really have essentially three things that it can occur on this directional concept. I could have like something like this, where it's pretty easy to say that um, all of x is in the direction of, of y, right? There's definitely same direction, so contribution. This idea of contribution would be if you change x's length, is it going to contribute to what, if we would look at contribution, if x and y are pulling a rope, right? The more x pulls, possibly the more or less y can pull to do the same amount of work because they're contributing in the exact same direction. On the other hand, if x and y aren't quite in the exact same direction, there's still some contribution, right? There's still this idea of, hey, there's a little bit in the y direction. But there's some definitely part that's not in the y direction. And so there's this part where if I pull on x, y is going to be, oh, you're helping me. But there's going to be some wasted effort because I notice you're pulling it. <laughs> that, that's not helping me. I want to go in my direction, and you're not pulling it in my direction. That's not helping in contribution. But there is some. And so there's this idea of exact same direction, which would be you know, true inline contribution. Here we could have some contribution of x in y's direction. And on the other hand, we can actually have something like this. And we normally draw this and put a little bar on that, which is essentially, if you pull x, is y going to notice that you're helping him? No. And here, if I look at this, I have absolutely no contribution for x in y's direction. And normally when we have this word, uh, if I would see this, what sort of special words normally go along with this? Orthogonal. Orthogonal. Perpendicular. Perpendicular. What normally is a special word for exactly inline contribution or same direction? Parallel. parallel. Now, the word parallel and the word perpendicular are reserved for geometry. So these are reserved for R2 and R3. So when actually you're using these words, when you say perpendicular, you're talking about two-dimensional space or three-dimensional space. If you say parallel, you're talking about two-dimensional space or three-dimensional space. Outside of that, we're going to have some other words that we're going to need to have to work up. Just like this, the whole idea of using length. If it doesn't have this physical concept of length, length is a word that is tied to R2 and R3 space normally. It's like go out, grab it, pull a tape measure out, that's how long it is. That doesn't make sense when we go up into hyper dimensions. Like, oh, this is a 12th dimensional space. Well, all right. Or if it gets really weird geometries. For example, if I put two points on the surface of the Earth, right, what's the length of the line between those two points? Well, it depends on where the line runs. So normally we talk about length, you know, for us. If I have two points and you say how far away are they are, what do you connect them with? Straight line. Straight line. Why do I use a straight line? The it's the shortest length, right? And so that's normally how we say distance. On a ball, what's the shortest? How do you actually find the shortest? What you do is you take the ball and you rotate it until you see that there would be a line that would connect these two points. And if I would take this line as a cut, and I cut through the entire ball, it would go through the center of the ball. So what's the shortest way to go from Chicago to, uh, say, Beijing? You rotate the Earth until you find a cut that goes through those two points and the center of the Earth, which is why they go up towards the North Pole. It was like, well, fly west. And like, no, you fly north-ish, northwest-ish, and you go over Alaska, and you see all these nice pretty things, and you end up... You know, over in Japan, South Korea, wherever you want to be on that part of the world. 
And so that's how you do shortest paths. And so you have this behavior that we have to understand and reinterpret for whatever we're working with. Um, eventually, we're going to start off in R2 and R3, do things that make sense, parallel, perpendicular. In other words, apply analytic geometry. We've all had a geometry course to study geometry. And then after that, we're going to pull it back and say, can I generalize what I just did, get rid of the things that strictly tie it to R2 and R3, open it up to Rn, and eventually open it all the way up into polynomial space, matrix space, vec uh, sorry, into uh, continuous functional space. What happened and what do I have right, that would do the same thing that I understood in normal Euclidean two-dimensional geometry? In other words, do a specific examples until we can figure out something generic. And the study is to try and figure out lengths and this contribution concept. So 5.1 begins the study of orthogonality and also length, really. Length in Rn. And really, we'll start off in R2 and R3. So we're going to use R2, R3, and analytic geometry to start our discussion. So R2, R3 with geometry. So geomeasure, world measure, and I probably ought to get rid of the word geometry. I'll say Euclidean geometry. And when we do this, again, because um, in a flat world, what are the sum of the internal angles of a triangle? 180 degrees. On a spherical world, that's not true. Imagine on a, on a ball. What could I do? I could start at the North Pole, go to the equator, run around the equator, and that's at 90 degrees, and then take this thing at a 90 degree and drop it down. That would be at the North Pole and drop it down at a 90 degree to what that one was and come down here. It will also meet it at 90 degrees. So I can actually have a triangle on the surface of the Earth that has three angles, all of which are 90, and it's still a triangle. Right? So it definitely breaks those rules. Right, So that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the geometry that we all understand as nice, normal behavior. Um, that actually introduces questions when we start to model mathematics and geometry. Is the universe Euclidean? There's three spaces. If I would make a triangle in, the, in our solar system, would the internal angles of this triangle sum to 180 degrees? or it's sum to greater than 180 degrees or less than 180 degrees, which would tell us that we don't have Euclidean space. It's either possibly elliptic or hyperbolic, some sort of weird geometry going on. In other words, that makes some rather interesting questions about <laughs> traveling. But we assume Euclidean. It'd be nice if we would throw three uh, satellites very fast in three cardinal directions out of our solar system, and then they can measure their angles accurately between, and we could answer that question. My, my current assumption would be that we would notice that it changes according to uh, mass interactions, of, like more mass in the solar system as we go out, it would behave differently. But I don't know, because I haven't done that experiment. So Euclidean geometry. All right. Easiest way to do this is contribution is best measured by what? Angles. <laughs> so it looks like theta is probably the best way to talk about this a metric, right? If I want a metric of contribution, I would like to say no contribution, exact contribution, or some contribution, probably the metric that I know best would be just simply theta. And so if you want a contribution or some sort of direction measure, 
Let us use theta. Seems reasonable, right? We'll use trigonometry. And if that's x, and that's y. All right, well, if I have this thing here, if I have two vectors, and I have some sort of theta going on here, I could actually take that and say, well, all right, let's use a little bit of geometry on it. Paste. Um, geometry that I understand from Euclidean geometry, what we normally do is not use two sides, but rather create three sides. And if I make this vector here like this with its tail here and its head here, what vector is this? Y minus X. It's Y minus X. Y because it has the head on the Y, X because I took away the X component. You have the Y vector and you subtract the X vector, it lifts it up to the head of the vector. I mean, you can imagine it that way. This is your Y, you take away X, it just slides up to X, and now that's your new vector, Y minus X. Easiest way to imagine. Now, do I have any trigonometry which is based upon algebra and geometry that would allow me to try and calculate theta? We have law of sines and the law of cosines. What's the law of cosines? Okay, if you have a theta, the all right, if this was a right triangle, the law of cosines, if the law of cosines would drop to the Pythagorean theorem. What's the Pythagorean theorem? The sums of the squares of the sides is equal to the square of the hypotenuse. How do you know the hypotenuse? It's the opposite. It's the opposite of the angle, right? The law of cosines is the Pythagorean theorem, but in a more generic way. And what you do is you have, okay, that means that this, if we would say the opposite, the square of the side opposite, the square of the hypotenuse, is the sums of the squares of the sides. This is still true-ish with a correction. What's the side opposite? I need to know that's length. Ooh, I don't have a length measure yet. Well, we'll have to eventually get that. Um, we shall use a way too many doubles. <laughs> How long is y minus x? Okay, that's the length of the side opposite. Squared would be the sums of the sides squared. And then what makes this the law of cosines? You have a correction, minus 2x, y, don't you love all the doubles here? <laughs> cosine theta. At 90 degrees, what's the cosine of theta? Zero, and so all of that would have been gone, right? And then we would have Pythagorean theorem. Notice how it shrinks it, right? As as we have an angle, we're we're taking away, you know, this, we're having this con contribution that's being removed. All right, so but that requires length. So all right, I have a little geometry. Uh, this doesn't help me. All right, I need length to be able to do this. Um, we need. What's the length of a vector to be able to continue this particular problem? All right. Um, I can actually get this. Uh, what is, so note, what is x transpose y times y? What is that normally called? Yeah, x transpose times y. So x without a top on it, right? Says it's column by by transposing it, it makes it a. It's a row times a column. A row times a column is called the inner product. If I took a column times a row, it'd be the outer product. In other words, this is the inner product. Well, what is the inner product? It's x one y one plus x two y two plus everything up to x n y n, right? But definitely in R2, R3, if I would do R3, X transpose Y would be just simply X1, Y1 plus X2, Y2 plus X3, Y3. And it'd be like, well, you know, who cares? And R2 would only have two of those, right? But what would X transpose X be? x1 
x1, which is x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared. Does that look familiar? What's length in three-dimensional space? The square root of the sums of the squares. What is the square? What is the length in, in two-dimensional space? The square root of the sums of the squares. Hey, kind of a nice byproduct. It ends up being that, so the length of x is what? It's the square root, now let's do r2, nah, let's do r3. x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared. Okay, compare. What does that make the length of x? The length of x can rather be written as what? Square root of x transpose x. But that also says that the square of the length is the inner product with itself. Sorry, scalar product with itself. In terms of words, this particular thing is called the scalar product from previous sections. I need to be careful on my word. Because what's going to happen here? Um, scalar product is something that I can use to calculate length. So uh, how, how long is something? Take the scalar product with itself, take the square root of that, that's its magnitude. So all of a sudden, I have a metric, a metric, that allows me to handle part one. How do I know length and magnitude? Inner product. I have a thing that will actually just evaluate the inner product itself with a x transpose times x, eventually take the square root, will tell me exactly what the length is. So I have a tool to find it. Now what we're eventually going to do is if that, if a x transpose x is what I use for r2 and r3, I'll try to lift the x transpose x into rn, which will end up being, I don't have to do anything, it just works. But then we can say, ooh, what is x transpose x doing? And how can I lift that to study matrices or polynomials? And then we'll change its name from the scalar product to the inner product. We'll change it, we'll just tweak it a bit. What does a scalar product do and how can I generalize that idea of its action? So, but for now, we have what it is. We have a tool. So length is handled. And it's handled by simply using the scalar product. But now that I have length, We can go back to this guy. Now, what, what is my goal, all right? My goal is this here, theta, is the part that is like contribution. Uh, on the other hand, it really doesn't matter, I, I don't, really have to get theta by itself? I could, right? Perpendicular is pi over 2, 90 degrees. Parallel is 0 or 180 degrees, which would be 0 or pi, if I calculate it. On the other hand, since I have the cosine function, which is if I restrict myself on its domain is a one-to-one a -one invertible function, it might be enough to simply say, oh, I don't need theta, I need cosine theta. Because what's the cosine of 90 degrees? Zero. zero. And that would tell me perpendicular. Hey, is the cosine of theta zero rather than, well, if the cosine of theta is zero, you're at 90 degrees, and now you know you're at 90 degrees. Why did you have to do that? Just say it's the cosine of theta. In other words, if, if I can solve for cosine theta, this can tell me the idea of contribution or direction, right? How much in the same direction are we? So this can now be solved for. All right, what would cosine theta be? Negative 
If I had cosine theta by itself, what would you get? We would 1 over 2 magnitude x, magnitude y, all times. This would come over, this would come over, and then that would divide. All right, and so we would have the magnitude of x squared plus the magnitude of y squared minus the magnitude of y minus x squared. Is everybody okay with that? I moved this to the right, I moved this to the left, and then once that this was on the left, I took the two and moved it over. Everybody okay with that? Now, I'm going to leave that part alone, right, for now, because that, what's the magnitude of x? What can I replace it with? X transpose. X transpose x. What about the magnitude of y? Y transpose y. What about the magnitude of y minus x? It's y minus x transpose times y minus x. So it would be the inner product of those two. So we get to this whole cosine theta is equal to this 1 over um, 2 magnitude of x, magnitude of y, all times x transpose x plus y transpose y minus y minus x transpose times y minus x. Properties of transpose and distribution. This would become that the cosine of theta, which is going to be our measure for how much contribution is going on, be 1 over 2 magnitude of x. Boy, this looks really absolutely horrific, doesn't it? It's really horribly complicated, but that's x transpose x plus y transpose y minus, put a little parenthesis, y minus x transpose would be y transpose minus x transpose. Transpose would go through those particular sums. Why? Because what is y minus x? It's positional y minus positional x. Transpose that. Positional y transpose <laughs> minus positional x transpose. So the transpose just simply goes through addition, subtraction. But if that's y transpose x transpose, we would use y transpose multiplies both of those. And we would get y transpose y, and then a minus y transpose x. We would get a minus x transpose y plus x transpose x. Now inner product. Y transpose X versus X transpose Y. What, well, what is the inner product? All the elements in order just simply multiply and then add up. Well, if you did X1, Y1, or X2, Y2, would that change anything? Sorry, X1, Y1, or Y1, X1. Would that matter? No. So it ends up being that these two, these are equal. What happens to this guy and this guy? They cancel. What happens to this guy and this guy? They cancel. And that minus and that minus and that minus distributes, making it plus. And since these are actually equal, there's just two of them, which would cancel with that two. And so it ends up being that the cosine of theta is simply x transpose y divided by the length of x times the length of y. Now, in the end, I'm, I'm asking about directional part. I really don't care about the magnitude and mag magnitude of x and magnitude of y, right? So since I really don't care about, I want to do directional. The theta, this multiplication would still have the exact same ratio. And so if we would have rather used the unit vectors in the direction rather than actual x's and y's, if I would do u and v as unit vectors, it would have ended up that the length of u and the length of v is 1, and so you would still have the cosine of theta would be the unit vector in the direction of x, the unit vector in the direction of y, inner product. Scalar product. Darn it. I keep saying I'm jumping too soon. So guess what math we use to calculate length? 
scalar product. Guess what math we use to calculate directional contribution? Scalar product. So who defines the space? The scalar product. <laughs> so the scalar product itself will allow us to figure out lengths as well as angles. It's kind of odd that you can imagine this, but we actually can have spaces where you can imagine that as we do transformations and other things like that, that we can have some unusual bending effects in lengths. And so one of the things that we could ask about for like transformation or spaces is there transformations where angles are preserved, like as you move it, do angles still apply, right? If it was at 90 degrees, it stays at 90 degrees. Or does it actually make the angles change? And like lengths, maybe lengths are preserved. Like if I map from one space to another space, our lengths, if it was a length of one, it's still a length of one, but maybe angles become torqued. And so we do those sorts of questions of, in all of, of whether lengths and angles are same or different, we now have one form of math, the inner product, that will allow us to talk about angle differences as well as lengths. So we can study the internal structure of a vector space by knowing, of R2 and R3, by knowing the scalar product. The scalar product of X transpose X transpose Y for, sorry, uh, metrics of length and angles, which is this, you know, this idea of contribution or direction. Angles are probably the easier way of thinking about it. So if you have a vector, you have a vector, you want to find angles or contribution for this x and for this y, the scalar product will be what we will use to do that. All right, so what are all of those? One, length. How long is a vector? It's just, the easiest way to write it is to write it as a square. Uh, how, what is the square of the length? It's just simply a vector scalar product with itself, with itself. If you want to find the length itself, you would just simply take the square root of both sides. That's why, but I don't, the square root symbol is long and ugly. That's nice looking. It's easier to see. The square of the length is just simply the inner pro, the scalar product with itself. Uh, the second thing that we know the cosine of the angle is the scalar product divided by the length of x and the length of y. If these are obviously unit vectors, it's just the inner product. Um, three, because the cosine is stuck between negative one and one. That would mean this quantity here is between what and what? Negative one and one. But that means this denominator could go up to the right or go up to the left. And if it's between negative one and one, another way of talking about it is the absolute value of the cosine of theta is always less than or equal to one, which would say that the absolute value of that is less than one. But if the absolute value of that is less than one, that tells you that the absolute value of the scalar product is always less than or equal to the multiplication of the lengths. Physically, what is this saying? Uh, as a name, this inequality is called the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. 
we would look at this object here, what's the idea of the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality? The idea of the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality is the inner product, which is a number, right? It's cosine theta, right? If it's at 90 degrees, it flat out. If it's perpendicular, it's zero, right? What happens is when these things are at 90 degrees, it's zero, but as they get closer and closer and closer into the same direction, when they are in the same direction, that's the biggest this could be, and that's the equal part. It's just simply the multiplication of the two magnitudes. So if one is length two and the other is length three, their, inner pro their scalar product will be six only when they are parallel to each other in the exact same direction. What happens as we have less contribution? Right? As we have less and less and less and less contribution until they get 90 degrees, it goes from 6 all the way down to 0. In other words, think about effort contribution. Right? The, the scalar product is how much contribution of effort. In other words, if they're in the exact same direction, if one's pulling with 2 newtons, the other one's pulling with 3 newtons, right? 2 of 3, you know, these things just simply, this inner product would be the multiplication of their magnitudes. On the other hand, until it gets to this, it drops down to zero. It's less, 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 less. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Is everybody okay with that? And by doing the absolute value, obviously we would have the negatives, but the absolute value allows us to just simply get the upper end of it. You know, sign, don't have to worry about sign if we throw an absolute value on it. Is everybody okay? How the scalar product relates to how these things are con contri contributing towards one another. All right, fourth, obviously because at pi over 2, which is obviously 90 degrees, the cosine of pi over 2 is equal to 0. That implies x, y are orthogonal, which you would write like this. x is orthogonal to y, <coughs> parallel, so <coughs> perpendicular, if... If the cosine is zero, that means, go back to this thing here, if that was zero, then this had, the top of the other side had to have been zero, right? Because if they actually have lengths, they need to have two vectors that are not zero, right? So two things have to happen. If x itself is not the zero vector, y is not the zero vector, right? Because zero vector times anything is zero, so contribution would be zero on its scalar product, and then x transpose y is 0. If that's true, we use the word orthogonal. So that's a little definition. So everything that I wanted to know, length, orthogonality, not quite being orthogonal, maybe some other things are all measured and can be applied with simply the scalar product. So we need to be able to do the scalar product and we were able to answer internal structures of R2, R3 vector spaces. So Euclidean space is what we're basing this on. All right. If that's true, it actually leads to an interesting question. What if it's not zero? What's happening if I have a problem that has an actual angle x and y in between? In other words, they're not orthogonal, maybe parallel, but there's, there's this part of where they could be in the same direction, but somewhat same direction. In particular, what I could be interested in is there seems to be a part of x that is in the direction of y. And if I would find it, let's say we could call it p. But then if there's this p and going up this direction, I could have a part of x, which would be written as, if I put the arrow on this side, what would that be? x minus p, 
And when I look at that, I can sit there and say, you know what? X has two parts. X has a piece of itself that's in the direction of Y and a piece of itself that is orthogonal to the direction of Y. So we have these two parts. One, P is the part of X in Y's direction. And two, we have this X minus P is the part of X that is perpendicular to Y. Well, X minus P is easy to, easy to find as long as I have P. So the big part of this problem is can you find P? Can you go through it and figure out, okay, uh, can I calculate P? Um, so we need to find P. Well, we can do that with algebra and trig and geometry. So we need to find P here. Um, we're going to give it a name. Uh, if I would want to find P, it's a vector. A vector has two things. It has a magnitude and it has a direction. I already know its direction. What's its direction? Same as Y's direction. Now, uh, if I'm interested in Y's direction rather than Y, I probably ought to find something that has Y's direction in the simplest length I can think of. One. So that would be the unit vector in Y's direction. So um, if I want to find P, I'm going to need to know P's length. And two, we need same direction as Y. And the easiest one for that one, this is easy. I'll just say u, which is equal to y divided by y's length. That's trivial to do. Now, since that's a unit vector, I'll just pick the unit vector in y's direction. If I had a unit vector here, say if u was there, how could I, if that was u, how could I turn u into p? U's times P's length will be P. So, all right, okay, knowing that, and so that would mean P is going to be the length of P times U, and then we would be done. So we're back to I need to know P's length. If I can't find P's length, I'm kind of stuck. Uh, any ideas? The scalar projection of X on U. Well, that'll be the name for it. So this here, I need to know this, this length, right? Um, this is a right triangle. If I knew theta, could I, and is x given to me? Yes. And so what I have is a right triangle, so length of p is our problem. If I have a right triangle, and I know the length of the, if it's opposite of the right triangle, this is called the what? Hypotenuse. This is the side that is adjacent. So if I look at that, and it's like, okay, that would mean that this, using a little bit of trigonometry, since this is dropped down and that's 90, this side here is obviously the length of x. This side here is the length of p. This is theta. I know by trig, the cosine of theta is what? Adjacent, which is length of P, which, by the way, I'm looking for, divided by hypotenuse, with it, which is length of X. So 
length of x times the cosine of theta is the length of p. Well, I needed p's length, so let's go ahead and give this a name. Right? But if I would do this, uh, by the way, what was cosine of theta? But the cosine of theta was what? x transpose y divided by length of x, length of y. So that tells us that the length of p is what? all over the magnitude of y, because the x's cancel, right? Because this here is x transpose cosine. That's cosine. Put an extra x transpose right there. Sorry, length of x. That one would cancel with that one, leaving just the y. Yay? Nay? Nee? Yeah. OK. It's just an, an oddball way of doing a normal trig class problem. And so. The length of P is simply magnitude P, which is equal to X transpose Y divided by Y. Y's length. What's Y's length? Y transpose Y. Right. And so uh, Y transpose Y. Yep, square root, right? But I'll just leave it this way. Um, the, since we use this a lot, we don't say it's the length of P. What name do we call this, which was just said a second ago? This is called the scalar projection of P, sorry, of X onto Y. Why is it called the scalar projection? It's a length. It's a scalar number. Why is it called a projection? Physically, if you look at it, what does it look like? You would imagine this is like, it looks like a shadow. I'm projecting X onto Y coming down at 90 degrees at noontime sun, right? Come straight down and then we get that. And so this is called the scalar projection of X onto Y. So it gets its own name. So now that we have all that, that's all done. Now we get to have P, which is, becomes trivial. So what is P? It was what? The length of P times the unit vector, which was in the length of Y. Well, what is that? That's X transpose Y divided by the length of Y times, what was the unit vector? Y divided by the length of y. This is times. This is a scalar multiply, right? What's the length of x times the length of y? It's the length of y squared. How do we normally write the length of y squared? Y transpose y. Y transpose y. And so what is this? This is x transpose y divided by y transpose y. And then you, that's a scalar number. And then we just simply multiply it by y. And P being X transpose Y divided by Y transpose Y. What is this? That's the scalar product. That's how much contribution X in the Y direction divided by the length of Y squared times Y. In other words, we shrink Y appropriately and we get that out and we have Y. In other words, this is a scalar number. Y gets shrunk down to the appropriate P. And what's the name of this thing normally called? The vector projection. The vector projection. Why is it called the vector projection? Because it's a, a vector. vector. It's the vector projection of x onto y. So we can't cancel the mm, No, no, no. Like this sort of stuff? Right. OK. This is a vector. This is an operator on two vectors which spits out a scalar. This is an operator, it's a single operator on a single vector which is it times itself which spits out a scalar. Scalar divided by scalar is? Negative. 
scalar. So there's no canceling because the entire left of it is what? It's a real number. It's a real number times the vector y. So it's not a, there's no division, there's no, it's, and actually, do we have divides? Have we done any divides operator? No. But, well, that looks like a division. Yes, because it's a real number divided by a real number. Vectors don't get divided. They get added and scalar multiplied. Is everybody okay with that? So we now have the ability to say, do they have contribution at all? So if it's at zero, the answer is no, they're orthogonal. Oh, look, they have contribution. Oh, if they have contribution, I can find vector projections and scalar projections to be able to work that out. All right, that's it.